understand um, is the normal pathway of cardiac electrolyte division from the SA node to the AV node, the bundle to the br uh, bundle branches, the Purkinje fibers, and that's the, the appropriate order of operations. Um, we need to understand that um, what the names of the segments, what the waves are called, what the intervals are, um, and then you know what they represent. That's part of what we need to understand to start to, to be able to get to really to be able to comprehend an ECG. The orientation of the 12 leads, again, you know, the the uh, the frontal plane with the limb leads, you know, superior, inferior, medial and lateral. And then the six horizontal plane leads, which are the chest leads that are looking at it going anterior to posterior. OK. And then understand that, you know, each of the leads or each of the electrodes really as recording, you know, an average current um, going through the heart at a, at a given moment. Okay, so let's kind of begin to interpret uh, the normal waves that we would see on an ECG now. So let's start with the P wave, all right, since that's our first wave. And uh, so the first thing you understand is that the, the mean vector, right, is going from the SA node to the AV node. So here, all right, here's our SA node over here in the right atrium there, and the AV node, which is sort of on the inferior medial aspect of the right atrium. And you have to understand that when the SA node fires and it sends kind of like a, a rippling effect of current going through the atria, that funnels to the AV node. Now, again, at any given time, a bunch of those myocytes could be giving off vectors going in different directions, but we're really concerned about the mean because that's what the electrodes are going to read. And so the mean or the average vector that's going from the SA node to the AV node, really, it, it essentially points at the SA node, the SA node points to the AV node. So that, that the mean current really points in the direction from SA to AV node. And the angle of that, which is drawn by my arrow over here, all right, the angle of this is pointing really, if we took a look at it, I just kind of, you know, um, superimposed our, our leads on, on top of the heart cartoon here. You'll notice that lead two over here, which is at 60 degrees. You'll notice that that's probably the one that this vector is moving, um, you know, most directly towards. And so what you would probably see in lead two is uh, the most upright P wave, the most upright deflection, because it's moving basically directly at, at that electrode. And since that's that the positive end of two, you'd see a positive deflection there. And so that's why I have over here, lead two is usually the most positive, okay? So when we're assessing P wave, um, usually looking at, at two, that's where it's gonna see, you're gonna see that's the most positive because that's the most commonly the mean vector uh, moves in that direction. Uh, again, if we're assessing the amplitude of it, the amplitude does not normally exceed 0.25 millivolts. 0.25 millivolts, just to remind you again, that's two and a half millimeters. That's two and a half small squares. All right, so it doesn't usually exceed two and a half little squares or half of a large box, if you will. Okay. Now, a couple of things I wanted to point out is that if this is the mean vector going through the atria towards the a, uh, towards the AV node is in that direction. Again, this this arrow does not represent electrical activity in the ventricle at this time. This is simply the mean electrical activity going through the atria. And that seems to point at lead two. Uh, you'll notice um, if I took a look at a different one, let's say three, for example. If you look at lead three, um, and again, I've only drawn in limb leads here. I have not looked at the precordial or the chest leads. But here you'll see limb three is pretty much uh, like, let's say, a 90 degree angle or perpendicular to that mean axis there. And as you guys remember from the slides prior, that means the wave we're gonna see, if it is perpendicular, we're gonna see a biphasic wave with an equal upward deflection and downward deflection. So it's a biphasic wave. That means that lead three is essentially perpendicular to the movement of that, uh, that current. And since two is, most, is moving directly uh, at two, you'd see the most upward deflection. Whereas let's say lead one over here, it's moving in the direction of one slightly as well. So it would show an upward deflection. It just wouldn't be as upright. AVF down here, which I didn't draw in, but AVF, again, it's moving a little bit towards AVF as well. 
so there, there would be an upward deflection. It just wouldn't be as uh, a large of an amplitude as you'd see in two. So the next thing we do when we look at the P wave is, besides looking at the amplitude of it, which would be two and a half small squares, um, it shouldn't be longer than um, 0.12 seconds, 0.12 seconds. And uh, once we've assessed its sort of morphology too, we also want to know the timing of it. And so we look at what we call the PR interval. So the PR interval is, like, like I said before, I'm going to show you again over here. The PR interval looks at the beginning of the P wave, the start of that P wave, all right, to the start of the QRS, which is over here. So that's what you're seeing over here. This is the PR interval. The PR interval, all right, should be between 0.12 to 0.2 seconds. So that's three, that's three to five uh, small boxes, all right, or um, you know half to one full or one large box. All right, I also put it in millimeters over here, so you guys can see it in terms of its measurement. Uh, so that's that's its normal range, okay? Quickly, just to kind of give you a quick clinical correlate of that, let's say that it's beyond that range, it's larger than that range, so it's greater than 0.2 seconds, for example. It's great, so the length of it from the start of the P wave to the start of the QRS is greater than one large box, for example. Well, that could be a, a possible conduction block. Maybe there's a um, you know some sort of scar tissue that's been built up or some some other kind of reason why we might have a, a conduction block so it's taking longer for it to to get through the av node on the other hand if it's less than 0.12 seconds or less than three small boxes long that's too short and so that would suggest possible what we call a pre-excitation syndrome so we'll learn more about that and that would be essentially where it's firing too soon All right, so now let's let's talk about the QRS. And the QRS takes a little bit more effort because the uh, the pattern with which electricity moves through the ventricle is very defined and very quick, and it's much larger uh, electrical currents going through the ventricle than there are in the atria. So usually with the atria we see sort of a small rounded mound, whereas in the QRS we see very sharp peaks and and, and upward and downward deflections, and it's very characteristic of the pattern with which electricity is moving through the ventricles, which again, the electrical activity goes from the AV node into the septum, down those bundles towards the apex and then up the lateral walls. And so that's a very characteristic pattern and that's what the QRS is essentially representing. So the Q, to start with that, the Q waves, physiologic Q waves are normal. And we'll talk about pathological Q waves later, but these Q waves, they represent something called septal depolarization. So just gonna give you a quick idea is that when the ventricles first start to depolarize, okay, when they're first starting to depolarize, and I'm gonna draw it over here a little bit, there's a little region over here, I'm gonna highlight this in blue, this little dot, that's really on like the left side of the septum. And when it depolarizes, it gives off a vector, a mean vector that points in this direction. Okay, it points like that. And when it points like that, that's the very first thing that happens. Like the first cluster of cells that, that are going to depolarize are going to give a mean vector that points in that direction. And remember, I have one over here. All right. If I was looking at uh, my, all my lateral leads, it would be one. There's um, AVL. Don't forget V5 and V6. Those are all what we call the left lateral leads. They would all be looking at the left side over here, all these leads. And this current would be moving initially away from them, right? This little septal right here, this little septal depolarization, that's the very first thing that really happens within the ventricle. It's tiny and it moves away from our left lateral leads over here. And if it's moving away from, we should see a negative deflection, which I've drawn over here in one, this tiny little deflection there. And that's why we see that deflection. But then as it progresses, the rest of the ventricle starts to depolarize. So there's going to be a section of the uh, ventricle, which is going to be the rest of the septum, as well as this portion over here and over here, let's say. So that starts to depolarize, and let's say that, that depolarizes simultaneously, then you're going to end up with a, a vector that's pointing more towards the apex here. And that would be the average vector at that moment. 
And then lastly, you know, we, you know, as the rest of the walls over here depolarize and over here depolarize, the vector is going to swing a little bit more in this direction, or I should say a little more in this direction here, in line with the arrow that I have here, this red arrow. So in other words, let's just think of it in, in terms of chunks of cells depolarizing at a time. You initially have this little septal depolarization, which faces away from our lateral leads, which gives us a little Q wave. Okay, that Q wave is less than 0.1 millivolts. It's less than a small little box in amplitude. And it's usually not longer than, uh, or not, the duration is not longer than 0 0.04. So it's usually within the width and length of one tiny little box. And that's normal. Okay. And it's usually only found in those lateral leads, which I have over here, 1 AVL, V5, and V6. The remainder of the myoc myocardium, then, after that little septal depolarization, it goes really basically rest of the septum towards the apex depolarizes next, and then up the sidewalls, which I mentioned. If it goes down towards the apex next, I drew it slightly leaning towards the left initially. The reason I did that is, yeah, there's some of the, the right HM is also, assuming the right ventricle is also depolarizing as the left ventricle is depolarizing at the same time. Those myocytes are doing it at the same time. However, the left ventricle is thicker, it has more muscle, and therefore more electrical activity. Okay, so there's more current being drawn from the left ventricle under normal circumstances. So the average at that moment is going to be skewed towards the left. And then finally, as the rest of the ventricles on both the right and left side uh, depolarize, the um, the vector actually swings swings a little bit more to the left again okay and that's again because more of the ventricular myocardium uh, gives off more has more electrical activity relative to the the right the right ventricle and so what we're seeing is the mean vector this red arrow the big red arrow represents the mean ventricular electrical activity all right after the entire ventricle has depolarized, would give us an angle somewhat like that, All right. which is really facing between uh, leads one, and this would be, say, lead two over here. So it's somewhere really between leads one and lead two, and so therefore, in lead two, you can kind of see, my video is obscuring it, but the lead two would show an upright, so this is our R wave over here, All right. there's an upright R. You see an upright because it's heading towards or between both one and two, all right? You'll notice that over here, AVR, the R wave is negative going because it's heading away from the, uh, the electrode AVR. If I were to draw it down here, AVF, it would also be positive going. AVL, which is over here somewhere, uh, might also be somewhat positive going. Three over here, if we were to draw that in, three um, might be somewhat perpendicular, so it might actually even look biphasic, something like that, okay, because it's almost at a 90 degree angle to that, okay, so it might look biphasic. So I wanted to just kind of reiterate uh, the electrical activity and how it's moving through, uh, how it's moving through our, uh, our ventricles. Again, because the P wave is very simple in terms of its, its conductivity, but the ventricle has that pattern, right? So if this right here, just look here at this initial one over here. So we'll label this A over here. So in this cartoon, this, this is actually depicting just the ventricles. So this would be the you know right ventricle over here, and then this is the left ventricle over here. This would be the inside of the ventricles. This would be the, the septum here highlighted in blue. Okay, this would be the left ventricular wall. This is the right ventricular wall. And so <clears throat> what you have is our initial current. Okay. Let me good color for that. Our initial current, if you recall, is going to be here. A little cluster of cells. I'm going to put that in green. And I told you that the vector is pointing away from our leads. So what I have is I've drawn in a couple of leads for you guys. So here's limb lead AVF and here's limb lead AVL. So at 90 degrees AVF and about negative uh, 30 for AVL. And so the first thing that happens in the, in the ventricles, we get that septal depolarization. And you'll notice it faces away from AVL, so we get a negative deflection there. And it's uh, somewhat towards, all right, problematic because my drawing's a little off, but it's somewhat towards AVF or at least somewhat in that direction. 
And so you'll see there's a little bit of a positive going deflection in AVF. All right. Uh, again, if I had three over here, three would definitely show uh, you know a positive deflection. But then, and again, it's only a small amount, so we don't see a large amplitude in, in terms of that initial deflection because it's a tiny number of cells. Over here, all right, so if we take a look, more of the heart is now depolarized. So we've gone from this tiny little section over here that gave us our initial septal depolarization, but then the rest of the septum depolarized as well as portions of the apex and portions of the left and right ventricular wall. And you'll notice that the vector now, the mean vector now points here. Okay, that mean vector is still somewhat heading towards AVF, so we see it's still positive going, <clears throat> excuse me. And in AVL, it's starting to swing around towards AVL, so it's starting to head upwards or it's heading in a positive direction now. <clears throat> and you'll notice that the vector points slightly towards the left again because we have more cardiac myo uh, myocytes and more tissue on the left ventricle, so therefore more uh, electrical activity there, which outweighs this, the right side over here. And finally, if we swing further when the rest of the ventricle depolarizes, it moves towards AVL, let's say, and you see more of an upward deflection. And then AVF now is kind of going away from AVF, and so we're seeing a, a more negative deflection there. And so this is giving you kind of an example of the, you know, step one, which is over here. All right, here's one, here's two, and then here's three. All right, septal, then towards the apex, then towards the lateral wall there. This doesn't mean that just the, at the very end here, that just the left ventricular depolarized. It also depolarized on the right side as well at the same time. It's just, again, right ventricle has a lot less mass than the left ventricle, so the average is skewed towards the left. And so the point of this, to kind of show you this, is to help you figure out why we have the shape of QRSs that we have. All right, it's based on its view of this particular pattern. All right, so you'll notice that the, you know, in the AVL, it sees a Q and then an R, and then in AVF, uh, AVF would see, I didn't draw the rest of it here, but you see an R and then you see an S, and that tells us the pattern there. Now that's, um, you know, this perspective of kind of looking at the, the QRS from the perspective of the limb leads. If we look at the chest leads or the precordial leads, V1 through V6, now remember V1 through V6 go across the chest starting on the right side of the sternum, then to the left side of the sternum, and then across the chest into the, the axillary region. And that again looks at the horizontal view of the heart. All right, so an anterior, posterior kind of view. What we're seeing is if we keep in mind the same pattern of firing, where we had our little septal depolarization and then maybe it swings this way a little bit. And then finally, when it's finally depolarizing, we have, you know, this, the one in red over here, our final. All right. That sort of electrical movement, <laughs> it can be depicted on the, the leads here. So in, in V1, for example, we see a little bit of a, an R wave. You can see a little R wave over here. And then there's the deep S wave. There's a larger R wave here and a deeper S wave. And you notice the R waves get larger and larger as we go. And so you'll also notice that the S wave gets smaller and smaller. And then over here in V6, we see a little Q wave. That's our, our Q wave there. Here's an R. So what's happening is if we imagine this for a second, that the septal wave initially kind of points towards V1. So we see a little upward deflection in, in V1. Um, but the bulk of the electrical activity is moving away from V1, so we see a large downward S deflection. Okay. Now, some of that uh, is moving in the general direction of V2, so we see a little bit larger of an R wave in V2, but mostly it's primarily downward, meaning it's mostly moving away from the V2. You'll see initially there's a you know, fairly large or a larger R wave and then a smaller S wave here which is telling you that V3 is in not so much depicted in my cartoon, but V3 and V4, they tend to be more of our biphasic waves. This one is actually pretty close to being perpendicular. This one is kind of moving more towards it and not so much away from it. And then right here, it's really moving towards it and not very much away from it. And then finally, in our V6, V6 is showing that little Q, that's a little septal depolarization, which you can sometimes see in those left lateral, left lateral leads, one, two, 
um, AVL, V5, V6, and then you see a nice large R wave. And so this increasing R wave usually peaks at around V5, which you can see over here is pointing at uh, V5. Peaks at V5, and since the uh, the bulk or the mean of that electrical axis is or electrical uh, current is moving towards V5, we see the largest upward um, deflection there. And typically, since that's the largest, v, uh, the R wave in six is a little bit less than that. And we refer to this increasing from V1 to V5 in the R wave as R wave progression. And so this is normal kind of to show you that the electrical activity kind of you know points a little bit, at least the current points a little bit at V1 at first and then swings really towards the left um, and points more directly at um, V5 overall. And that gives us this what we call R wave progression. So this, this uh, slide is to hopefully kind of help uh, clarify some of what I was just referring to in the R wave progression. So this is showing you with the leads V1. So there's V1 down here in A, and you can see V6 over here. Let me change color to make this easier. So here's V1 and V6. V1 and V6 are essentially kind of opposite to each other. All right, so we see that initial septal depolarization, an upward deflection of V1 since it's moving towards it, and a downward deflection of V6 since it's moving uh, away from it. And then you'll notice in part B when they're, you know, this chunk of the vent uh, ventricle, the septum and the left ventricle and right ventricle are depolarized. Our mean is here, okay? That mean is kind of pointing somewhat away from V1 now and more towards V6. So this is going, so V1 is going downward and V6 is now starting to go upward. Then the mean switches or starts to swing, excuse me, more towards the left again over here and so now it's going away from V1. So that's uh, going downward a lot more. And it's more towards V6, so that's going upright a lot more. And then uh, then it goes, the rest of it depolarizes, excuse me, depolarizes. And so what you're left with is the, the shape that we had because of the pattern with which the electricity was moving. And if we take a look at, here's our V1 again, and here's our V6, which are opposite to each other. So you see V1 has a small upward deflection and a large downward deflection, and that's normal. V6 should have essentially the opposite of that, which is a small downward deflection initially and a large upward. And so they should really be what we call reciprocals of each other or opposite sides of each other. And if we take a look at each lead in a different position, shows the R wave getting gradually larger. We call that R wave progression. Okay, so hopefully that gives you guys an idea um, of why the, the QRS has its, its morphology, okay? Now the, the QRS interval or the duration of the, the QRS complex is very short. It's less than, well, here's less than 0.1 seconds. So this is, this is normal, it's less than 0.1 seconds. That's about two and a half small boxes. So it's very, very quick. Um, the other part here, that was the the ST segment and the ST segment is back, basically back to the baseline or flat. And what that really is telling you is that after depolarization takes place, uh, there's a uniform charge on the outside of the ventricles. And so therefore the electrodes don't pick up any current activity. And so it goes back to our isoelectric point or our flat line. And then when it repolarizes and we have a distribution of charges again, we get the T wave. And the T wave represents uh, ventricular repolarization. Couple things you need to note is that you notice that repolarization does not look like depolarization wave. So it doesn't follow the same pattern. Also, the um, repolarization wave, its duration is longer than the depolarization of the QRS. Um, and it's, it's much longer actually. And so you see the shape of it is dome shaped like a P wave and its duration is much longer than the QRS. Also, the, the T wave itself or during repolarization, uh, is highly susceptible to different kinds of influences in the body and, and you know, um, chemical influences and so on. And it can make the T wave somewhat variable. And um, we're going to see some of those variations a little bit later on. And uh, under normal circumstances, when you see a positive going uh, QRS, mostly an upright, let's say a very um, large R wave, you would also see... Um, you know, a more uh, upright going T wave associated with that. So that would be normal. And um, 
if it's you know downward going when you have a positive going R wave, then that might suggest something like a repolarization abnormality. So for example, if I just draw right here, um, here's the you know on R wave, the T wave should also be positive going, and that would be normal. Now, if on the other hand, let's draw it like this. If I have a positive going, primarily positive going QRS there, and you see it's going downward, that's abnormal. And that represents like a repolarization abnormality, and that would be something that we could interpret, and I'll talk about that later. But it shouldn't look like that, all right? And so this brings me to sort of the last kind of point I want to make about the, the T wave and the fact that it's upright. And there's a reason for this, and it's a reason we need to kind of quickly go over so we understand more about the pathology when we see it. So for example, as a reminder, let's say I'm going to draw a couple cells. So let's say I draw this cell over here. I'm going to draw one. I'm going to draw two. So let's say those are three cells. I'm going to put a little electrode over here. All right, that's my little positive electrode. All right, it's reference point again. It's going to be somewhere over here. Let's say that's the negative end, and this would be the positive end over here. And let's say um, you know our current is is moving in this direction during depolarization. So therefore, we have again, let's say positive charges on the surface and negative charges there. So the vector would point towards here, and we would see an upward uh, deflection. Correct. Now, I'm going to draw another three cells down here. I'll put my electrode in the same spot. It's my electrode. Here's the reference points over here. And what I want to suggest here is this, is that um, if, let's say, we have completely depolarized. So if we've completely depolarized, that means the outside of these cells here are now, I'm going to draw on both sides to help us see it clearly. We're all negative and the insides of the cells would be positive relative to that. And so right now at this point, if it's completely depolarized, there is no vector for this one. There's no vector here. And in fact, let me just erase this to make sure that that's clear. Let me get rid of that vector for now because I want you to focus on this second one. There's no vector here. This would just show basically a, a flat line at this point because there's uniform electrical charge on the outside of those cells there. And so we would see just an isoelectric point, okay? Even though now these cells have been fully depolarized, which is why it's more negative on the outside than on the inside. Now, let's just say, for example, that the cell closest to the electrode over here, this, so this cell right here, this cell closest it might have been the uh, last one to depolarize, because remember up here, this, this is our same cells up here. So this is cell one, two, and three. One depolarized first, then two started to depolarize, and then three would have been the last one to depolarize. Okay, that was the direction that that was moving in. But let's say in these cells here, after we've depolarized them all, three was the last one to depolarize. Okay, but... Let's say, for instance, in this case, it's the first one to repolarize. So it's the last one to depolarize and the first one to repolarize. Therefore, three has the shortest action potential. Okay. And so let's let's draw that out to see what that looks like. So if I have three here, I'm going to erase. I'm going to erase these charges here. Okay. And let's say it starts to repolarize, which means, let's say the cell repolarizes, so the negative, or excuse me, the positive charges now on the outside. So that cell has now repolarized. And so if it's repolarized first, and then let's say the next one to repolarize is going to be this cell over here. So I'll say, we'll just draw it like as if it's starting to repolarize. All right, so I'm going to draw it as if it's starting to repolarize. The question is, how would you draw the vector for this? Where's the current going? Well, the reality here is that the current is actually still pointing 
towards the positive charges, right? Because that's how we, we, we draw the vector. So even though it's repolarizing in the opposite direction from three back to one, the current is still pointing at our positive electrode and we're seeing an upward deflection. We're still seeing an upward deflection. Okay? So we see an upward deflection because again, the current is still moving towards that, even though we're repolarizing in the opposite direction. So let me see if I can put this now into the context of the T wave. Okay, so normally in an ECG, we see uh, when there's a, a predominantly upright QRS, like an upward deflection, we also see an upright T wave, okay? If this is my P, QRS, and T wave, you'll notice that my predominantly upright going R wave, and then I have my T wave, which is upright along with it. So again, the question is, well, why is it still upright? And this, in order to understand um, why it's upright, there's, or in order to understand sort of the electrical activity in the heart and why it gives us the shapes it does for the QRS and for the T, uh, we need to first understand the pattern with which um, the electrical is, the electricity is conducted through the ventricles during depolarization, which is through the septum, apex, up the lateral walls. Now we need to know what's the, the pattern of repolarization. Okay, so in the pattern of repolarization, there's something we need to understand is that during repolarization, uh, we have repolarization occurs from outside to in. So from the epicardium into the endocardium. So if we remember anatomically, we have layers of the heart. So let me draw this for example. Endocardium, myocardium, and epicardium. So these represent the three layers of the heart, essentially. And so the endo being the innermost, myo is the middle layer, and then the epi is the outermost layer of the heart. And I'm going to draw a, a little electrode over here. Okay. Now, in normal circumstances, during depolarization, the innermost layer of the heart, the endocardium, is actually the first to depolarize. So I'm going to put a little one there. And then myocardium is two, and then epi is three. So in other words, the heart depolarizes from inside out, from endocardium out to epicardium. All right. So if we take a look at that, let's draw that out first. So let's start with our standard resting cells. Okay. That means the outside would have positive charges, and it's at rest, so it's a uniform charge on the surface of the cell. This electrode wouldn't be picking up any any current, so it's a flat line. And let's say it starts to depolarize. Well, endocardium depolarizes first. So I'm going to change the charges around here. Now I have a charge difference, right? This is depolarized. And remember, the vector always points towards the, uh, the positive end of the current. So we have current now. So it's going to be pointing at the electrode. And so what we're going to see is a positive deflection. This is what we talked about earlier with the single cell model. Now, let's just say the entire, all the layers have now depolarized. Okay, so they're all depolarized. Negatives. So now they're all depolarized. And now they're all depolarized, we have a uniform charge. Remember, this was still positive going because the current was in that direction, but now it's gone back to baseline. It's gone back to baseline because now we have a uniform negative charge on the surface, and so therefore now it's back to baseline, our isoelectric line. Okay. So now all three layers are depolarized. Okay. So they're all depolarized, and now the next question is, you know, how does it repolarize? And so repolarization takes place in the opposite sequence. So the epicardium, the epicardium, the outermost layer, is actually the first to repolarize. So it was the last to depolarize and the first to repolarize. So it has actually the shortest action potential duration. So I'm going to draw that here. All right, so the inside becomes negative again because it's repolarizing. And so what you'll notice is the epi repolarize fastest, shortest action potential. These are still depolarized. The endo and myocardium layers, layers are still depolarized. So the question is now, what's the direction of the current? Well, on the surface of the 
the heart now, we have a difference in charge, negatives and positives. And remember, we always draw the vector pointing towards the positive charge or in the direction of current flow, which is towards the positives. So our vector is still pointing towards our electrode. And, but this is during repolarization, which is slower, okay? But it's still pointing, the current is still pointing at our electrode, so it is a positive deflection. I drew a peak here initially because the peak is during depolarization happens much faster, all right, much shorter, uh, much shorter duration. But repolarization is slower. The current still faces her because epicardium has repolarized first. So that means the positive charge is redistributed to the outside, and therefore our difference in charge, our vector still points in that direction. So if I take and do this one next, all right, this then repolarizes. All right, and this just becomes a larger a vector. All right, so it's still positive going. And then ultimately, all of them will repolarize. So the endocardium, by the time the endocardium repolarizes, we're back to our baseline. We're back to our baseline. And you notice the T wave is upright. Okay, so the T wave is upright because repolarization occurs from outside to in, which was the opposite which was the opposite of our um, depolarization. Okay, so the QT interval. So just to remind you, the QT interval is from the, let's draw it here, all right? It's from the start of the Q, right? QRS complex to the end of the T wave. And so that's the QT interval. And so that's really the entire duration from ventricular depolarization to repolarization. And under normal circumstances, the QT interval should be about, or should be less than 0.44 seconds. All right, so it should be less than 0.44 seconds. Now, um, you'll, you'll notice the, there's a little C over here under the QT, so I'll explain that in just a minute, but this, that, that stands for correction, so it's a corrected QT. Um, so a couple of the points that I make here, the T wave is wider than the QRS. Um, it has a longer duration, which I mentioned before. Uh, the QT interval, now importantly to understand is the QT interval actually varies with the heart rate. Because again, if the heart rate has gone up, the duration of the action potential goes down. So therefore the QT intervals would go down uh, or become shorter, I should say. And so the QT interval should become shorter with an increasing heart rate and should become longer with a decrease in, in heart rate. So in other words, this rule of the QT, uh, the normal QT being less than 0.44 seconds, pertains, uh, or no, I shouldn't say it should, pertains, uh, can be actually somewhat measured or what we call eyeballed. Uh, if the heart rate is between a normal heart rate between 60 and 100 beats per minute, we could actually just assess it quickly by looking at the R to R interval. Now, an R to R interval is one R wave to the other R wave, the amount of time from one R to another R. All right, so we actually have to measure or count the number of boxes between one R wave and another R wave to see how long that duration is. And then we'd see from the R to R, if we just take a look at that R to R interval, the QT interval from here to here, all right, and there's the R to R interval from here to here, that QT should actually be less than half or about 40% of the R to R interval. And just by looking at the, our normal over here, you can actually see the QT interval. If you were to hold your fingers up to that and, and compare it to the R to R interval, you would notice that the QT interval uh, is is about half if not less than half and so just by eyeballing it as long as the heart rate is between 60 and 100 beats per minute the eyeball method can actually be um, be helpful and a quick way to assess the QT interval and so that's one way to kind of look at it but again make sure the heart rates within the normal range and I'll teach you guys how to calculate a heart rate in just a uh, in just a little while now um, if the QT is prolonged which you're seeing down here all right, this LQ, LQTS, excuse me, it stands for long QT syndrome, and there's multiple causes for that, which we'll get into. But you'll see it's prolonged in this case. So if you compare the R to R interval with the length of this QT, you'll notice that it's, it's greater than 50%, and in this case, it's actually been measured to be about 0.63 seconds, which is a prolonged QT, and that comes with certain risks that we'll get into.
And again, since the QT interval is proportional to the heart rate, um, you know, it, it becomes important to do what we call a QTC or a corrected QT. And the correction is just a correction for the heart rate because at higher heart rates, um, 0.44 seconds and whatnot, um, you know, doesn't necessarily hold up as well. We might get different measurements because the QT interval at higher heart rates is going to become shorter and shorter, which it should. We just need to know, is it an appropriate amount that it's shortening or not shortening? And so the QTC is corrections for that. So I'm not going to get into the correction calculation right now, but, but understand that that's what the QTC stands for to take into account the changes in heart rate that can alter the QT interval. All right, so down to the last point again, typically 40% of one cardiac cycle. Uh, the QT interval is 40% of one cardiac cycle if, if the beats are between 60 and 100. So I, we can use that eyeball method. Uh, and we can also say it should be less than 0.44 seconds if you want to actually count out uh, the number of boxes and so on. Uh, but again, make sure you have the QTC, um, the corrected version, especially if with heart rates that are out of the normal range. So again, we, we do need to know how to actually calculate a heart rate, which is one of the most basic things you're going to be doing with an ECG. So if we take a look at what we call a rhythm strip. So a rhythm strip is really just uh, a longer recording of a particular lead. So for example, what you're seeing here in this strip, this could be, you know, this could be lead two, for example. And what you do is you take lead two and you just record it for a longer period of time. And this helps us to detect uh, or better assess the rhythm of the heart. And we'll get into how to do that more in, uh, you know, videos to come. So we take a look here. Uh, we want to calculate a heart rate. So let's take this rhythm strip, for example. You notice we have multiple complexes here. So we can see there's a PQRS over here, another PQRS over here. Each one of these represents the cardiac cycle or the heartbeat, right? And so I want to know, well, what's the timing of that? You know, what is the heart rate? And so the first thing I always suggest is try to find an R wave that falls on one of the uh, darker lines. So take this one, for example. That falls on one of the, the, the dark lines there, and that's going to make our counting a little bit easier. And so I'm going to compare one R to the other R, which we call the R to R interval. Just like I kind of mentioned on the QT. The R to R interval, though, what I'm going to do is I'm going to count the number of large boxes from one R to the other R. So, for example, if I count that here, I'm going to start one. Here's two, three, four, five. So there are five large boxes between one R wave and the next R wave, okay? Now, I need to know the timing of that. Remember, this is over time. If you guys recall, one small box is 0.04 seconds and one large box is 0.2 seconds, okay? So I can actually extrapolate, right? So I say, all right, well, there's five large boxes and each box is 0.2 seconds. So therefore, this is represents one second apart. So these R waves are one second apart. And uh, so that, that would be one way to kind of calculate. So they're, they're a, a second apart. I want to know in, in beats per minute. So if every beat is happening in a second, that means this person is having probably 60 beats in 60 seconds. So they're, you know, it's, it's uh, the heart rate is 60. But another way I could do this, right, and it's sort of a fast way to eyeball it, um, would be to divide by the number of boxes or the number of large, excuse me, divide 300 by the number of large squares in between. So, for example, if I have the R to R, I count five large boxes, 300 divided by five is 60. So that gives me the beats per minute, okay? 300, the number 300 is actually derived from the fact that um, if five large boxes makes one second, then five times 60 is 300. So there would be 300 large boxes in a minute. So that's, the, that's how where the 300 comes from. Now, really the sort of the quickest way to do it is to take that same rule, but understand that, uh, you know, if I say there's two large boxes between each of the R's, 300 divided by two, that's 150, right? Three large boxes, 300 divided by three, that's the heart rate's 100. Another way is do, you can do the countdown method, which may be simpler for a lot of people. So for example, there's five large boxes here. And I put in parentheses, 300, 150, 175, 60. They're there to actually represent the divisions for you already. Okay, so you don't have to do it in your head. So for example, 
in these five boxes, one box would be 300. The second box is 150, 100, 75, 60. So you can do a countdown method. You can just memorize those and it might help that. Uh, otherwise, you can do my division method, which whichever you're more comfortable with. But again, to do the countdown method, really for saying there's one box between each R to R, that's 300 divided by one, which is 300 uh, beats per minute. So I can do the countdown, there's five, 300, 150, 175, 60. So you can do that. All right, that'd be one way. Now understand that that is uh, a useful method in calculating heart rate if the rhythm is regular. And if you take a look at this rhythm strip, you notice that each of the um, the complexes look like they're evenly spaced and it looks like a very regular rhythm. So you can calculate, you can count between any one of those R to R's and it all have five boxes and it's very regular. And so it's easy to determine a heart rate. However, as I point, in, point out in the second bullet there, if there's an irregular rhythm, like in something called atrial fibrillation, for example, where you you know one beat and the next beat might be five boxes apart, but then the next beat's only three boxes from the last one, and the next one is is closer or even further apart from that. In other words, it's irregular and it's it kind of it's not evenly spaced apart from one R or from one complex to the next. That can be a little bit more difficult, and so. In those cases, what you take is you take that irregular rhythm, you use the the, the graph paper itself. I've, I've shown you over here one second, so that's marking off the one second. On a lot of ECG paper, they'll actually put little markers, like let's say over here and over here, and to represent, let's say, you know, um, three seconds or six seconds, right? So we can, we can count out the markers I just made, see how many seconds that is. But let's say it gives you uh, six second markers on, the, on the, the sheet there. What you'll do is you'll count the number of R waves in six seconds. Since they're not evenly spaced apart, you just count the number of R waves in six seconds, and that's gonna give you the average. So you say, all right, well, there's, you know, there's 10 R waves in six seconds, all right? Now remember, six seconds, I need it to be a minute, so you just multiply six times 10, right, to get 60 seconds. So we say, well, I counted 10 R waves in six seconds, so I got to multiply that by 10, that's 100. So I have approximately 100 beats per minute. And that's what you would do, you would give an approximation for something like AFib, where there's an irregular rhythm. But if the rhythm is regular, you just need to calculate between one R and the other R and just count the number of boxes down, okay? But if it's irregular, count the number of R's in a given time frame, and then, uh, and then multiply it to, to get to your minutes, okay? So finally, now we can actually look at a normal ECG, all right? So this, this would be a normal, and the thing I want you to kind of notice about this ECG here is first off, be able to figure out where your leads are, which ones are the limb leads, which ones are the chest leads or the precordial leads. So over on the left-hand side, you'll see one, two, three, AVR, AVL, AVF. Those are the limb, those are the limb leads, okay? They're looking at superior, inferior, medial, and lateral. Then on the right side, you see V1 through V6. So V1 starts on the right side of the sternum and V6 is in the axillary region. That's the precordial or the chest leads. That's the horizontal view of electrical activity. Okay, that's gonna be anterior to posterior as well as lateral. Okay, and so that's gonna give you that view. So it's important to kind of group them. And then the next grouping would be, well, which ones are gonna show me the left lateral aspects of the, the heart or the left ventricle there? If you recall from the earlier slides, that's one AVL, V5, and V6. So they might show very similar uh, patterns. And then you have two, three, and AVF, which show the inferior, which shows you again the inferior aspect of the left ventricle or even the right ventricle a little bit. And then you have uh, AVR, which is all the way to the right, which is um, usually going to show you, you know, negative because it's usually in the opposite direction of most of the current in the heart. And then the chest leads, V1 and V2 are the septal leads, V3 and V4 are the anterior uh, aspects of the left ventricle, and V5 and V6 are the, the lateral aspects of the left ventricle there. And at the very bottom, you'll notice that two is repeated. So you see down there, here's two. There's also two right here, okay? It's, uh, two was picked to be our, what we call, rhythm strip. So you notice that this one is longer in duration than the one that you saw up here. And so that actually gives us a chance to look at the rhythm a little more closely because it helps to have a longer strip.
to be able to assess any abnormalities in the rhythm. Okay, and so from here, you guys should try to calculate a heart rate. So again, look at the R to R, right? Find one that falls on the line, which is nice. You can see one right here falls on the line. Right? You can count the number of boxes, and it doesn't have to be precise because most of the time we don't need to know exactly what the heart rate is. We just need to know what the range is, and a close approximation will do. All right. Um, if we take a look at our R wave progression and our our limb, uh, excuse me, our chest leads. You'll notice the tiny little R wave over here, okay? Uh, you don't see much of a Q in the V5 and V6, but let's take a look at the Rs. You notice the R wave gets larger and larger, okay? So it has a pretty good R wave progression. All right, so that looks that looks good. And um, you take a look at uh, the R wave in two, two and one. If you remember, I told you that two and one will usually see most of the ventricular upright waves there and you'll see it there too you see that the r wave is pretty upright there you'll notice that uh, in avr it's it's downward going because the you know the mean vector is moving away from avr and then um yeah it's upright in avf as well looks like uh, avl is somewhat smaller but it's still upright uh, even three is somewhat upright still you'll see too if i'm looking at the p wave and i want to know what the, the lead that shows the P wave most upright is typically two. So we can take a look, is that the case? So in the limb lead, here's two, and there's our P wave. And sure enough, it looks to be like the most upright P wave we're seeing in any of those leads. And what you guys can try is take a look at this normal ECG and, you know, see if you can calculate some of those intervals. And, um, you know, look over it for yourself. And it takes practice looking at normal ECGs. And again, you can go online and look at ECGs to get enough to get more practice in, okay?